This is Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Intuitive Oracle Jamie Hearn. Jamie stirs the cauldron with witches, shamans, healers, psychics, and mediums who bravely share their power and give you insight into what conversations with dead people really look like. It's probably not what you think. Sometimes hilarious, sometimes macabre, and always informative. Hello and welcome back to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. I'm Jamie Hearn, and today I am super excited to hang with Jennifer Etzweiler. She is an animal communicator, author, and speaker. She found non-traditional methods that work for her to live with depression. That's huge because it's prevalent and a lot of people have a stigma around depression. So they don't, you know, like traditional methods of dealing with that, I don't think are all that effective, but hey, we can talk about that later. (laughs) Jennifer is an intuitive and talks to animals, arachnids, and sometimes even people. When she isn't filling the shoes of Dr. Doolittle, she can be found enjoying creative hobbies like sewing, knitting, and jewelry making. She's also frequently found on Zoom, helping others connect with each other and learn new things. If you're curious about what your animal friend might be thinking or saying to the next door neighbor's cat, then you can find her at jenniferetzweiler.com. And we will definitely include a link to that because spelling it could be challenging. (laughs) Yes, and it's spelled differently than you would think it would be, too. Yeah, I'm not even going to take a stab at it. <laughs> so just look for the link. We'll we'll include yeah. the link below. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I got a really interesting card for you. If you've listened before, you know I pull a card. I do most times. Sometimes I just get out of sync and I don't get to it. But the card that you got is called the Royal Order card. It's a really beautiful card. Oh, it is really pretty. And it's about how we aid each other in our own journey of ascension based on the concept of oneness, which is pretty interesting, especially as you're integrating the animal kingdom into your own journey of ascension. And I love that you talk to arachnids. That's fascinating. Um, So many people have a fear, but I think they're magical, beautiful creatures. And I would love to hear. Amazing. Right. And and it really how I got started is the funniest story. Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest and we have spider season here. And (laughs) And I can feel everybody shivering in the audience right now, but we do have spider season. It only lasts a week or two, um, but we have a large population of um, the scientific name is giant house spider. Um, And they're really big. And for a couple of weeks in the fall, they are out searching for mates. So they're really visible. Ah. And, um, and I had one, one year I had five really big spiders that circled above my head in my room for an entire week. And it was just the creepiest thing ever. But where were you at in like in your evolution at that point? Were you up leveling, creating? Not really. No, (laughs) (laughs) I, I had just moved home to help take care of my stepdad who'd been diagnosed with ALS and was to the point where my mom needed help getting him around. So I had just moved home and I'd always seen more spiders in that part of the house when I was a kid, but like not at this level, like this was just crazy. (laughs) And I don't even think at that point that I knew we had spider season. Like I didn't even know that was a thing. So we ended up, I ended up like drawing my line in the sand and we got to call an exterminator. I am not dealing with this. So we had no spiders for quite a while. And when they came back, they were thankfully much smaller. And I walk into the kitchen one day and there's this spider in my kitchen sink. And of course I feel bad because I've killed all these spiders. So I fish them out of the sink and put them somewhere else. 
Next day, he's back in my sink. So I move him, come back. He's back in my sink. So I'm telling a friend of mine about this. And I said, you know, you just kind of get spiders in the sink. It's a Pacific Northwest thing. There's this long pause. And she says, no, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I love it. She goes, she goes, I've lived here 20 years and I have never had a spider in my sink. I think you should go talk to the spider. And I just went, Brilliant. oh my God, are you kidding me? You want me to talk to a spider? But I trusted her. So I spent the next month doing dishes around the spider. And every time I walked into the kitchen saying, hello, what would you like to tell me today? <laughs> With a little bit of dread and a little bit of like, I'm going for this. So most of that time, I thought he was telling me his name was Friedrich. Spelled F-R-I-E. The day I figured out that he was really telling me friend, it came with so much love that like tears streamed down my face. Oh. Like I, this has been years and I still get choked up telling people about this because here was this spider that I have hated and killed and let my cats play to death and all the things. And it just wants to tell me it's my friend. <sighs> like, like it was just like, wow. That's and super so, powerful. Yeah, like super powerful. So ever since then, I actually look forward to spider season. It's like, you know, family reunion kind of friends show up once a year. And I kind of miss them when they don't show up, which Aww. I find bizarre. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> And I've joined spider and bug identification groups and it's taken me a couple of years, but I'm actually like, oh my God, are they adorable? They're furry. They're, you know, like <laughs> jumping spiders have little hairs on their head above their eyes that look like eyelashes. Like they are just <laughs> so cool. Uh, so, so this year has kind of been a spider theme for me. Um, I actually um, went to Atlanta and gave a speech on stage about how talking to spiders helped me conquer my fear of them. Cool. Uh, so, yeah. So that's 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 my big spider story. And the other one that I have is is the little one that got caught in my bra because like that actually happened. <laughs> OK, we all have to hear that one. <laughs> So, so I was, it was summertime and I was wearing a tank top and, and I'm large chested and it can be, I mean, we all know it's hard to fit bras, but when you get into the large sizes, you will often get gaping and things like that. So understood. Uh, yeah. So I was unwrapping something that was still wrapped in paper from my move. And there must've been a spider in there because the next thing I knew I could feel it crawling across my bare chest and of course I reached up and did this and it went into the gap of my bra <laughs> and you know like even though I like spiders and talk to them it doesn't mean I want them in my bra <laughs> So, you know, I'm, I'm doing the thing, I'm grabbing the underwire and shaking that tried to get the spider out. He lands on the ground and he's like, the legs are all curled up. Like, you know, when you see him when they're dead and I just mm -hmm. like, I'm terrified. But at the same time, it was like, oh my God, did I kill it? Oh my God, did I kill it? <laughs> so, so I sat there for about 30 seconds and it started moving its legs. Like I had just stunned it. So <laughs> Well, it sounds like you were equally stunned by the experience. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was like, oh my God, there's a spider in my bra. <laughs> just. I love it. The kinds of stories you just can't make up. Right? Well, and I think that that's like, that's really true in the whole spiritual realm like truth is really stranger than fiction yeah yeah so, i'm very much like when i hear something that it, when when it comes out of my mouth i couldn't make this up if i tried but here you go is usually like the stuff that's right on the money and yeah. and it's taken me a while to learn that like i it used to be like oh my god i can't say this this is the craziest thing ever 
Oh, right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've had, I've had messages from spirit, especially in readings where they're like telling me to say something. I'm like, I can't say no. What do you think? Stop. And then I end up saying it and the person's like, that's exactly what I needed to hear. I'm like, good. Cause I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Oh yeah. I, I was thinking about that before, uh, before I hopped on here is, is the one that I get so uncomfortable with. And whenever I don't want to say it, like it's, it almost feels like that NCIS Gibbs hitting you in the back of the head kind of thing. <laughs> totally is, know what you mean. <laughs> is yeah. Is, is I'll be talking to, to a person about their animal. And usually like, I won't have connected with the animal yet. And I will hear the guides say they really need to take responsibility for their part in this. The human does. And like, that's so uncomfortable to say to somebody I've never met. Like, but most of the time when I say it, they're like, yeah, I really needed to hear that. I've only totally. had like one or two that are like, yeah, no, I don't buy that. But you know, well, they're you do not your ready. Best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You do your best and you give them the message and, Maybe when they hear it the fifth or sixth time, they'll be ready for it. Yeah. So how did you start talking to animals? Oh, um, in the mid nineties, there was a bookstore here in town that had speakers in every Friday night. And I'd been looking at their list of stuff. And one night they had an animal communicator. And I just thought that was like, wow, what a superpower. And I went and I remember they tried to close the store twice before they actually got us out of there. Um, she like she only talked about how to communicate with animals for about 10 minutes. And then she did readings for like an hour and a half. Oh, wow. And she was just amazing. I, I mean, like you, every single animal had a different voice like different verbiage, like it was, and every single person was like, yep, that's exactly what my pet would sound like if they could talk, like <laughs> every person. And, and I was so fascinated. And a few months later, my pet rabbit got sick and I ended up calling her and to just work, help me work through that. And and uh, I found out she did classes and I went through all her classes and, and over the years I've taken, you know, weekend classes here and there, but during the pandemic, I found out that there's like a whole school for this where I could actually go and practice like every week and talk to an animal, like in a controlled setting with good feedback. And, and cause sometimes when you're learning to do something like this, like, your friends don't want to hurt your feelings. You need a stranger to get good feedback from. Understood. Yeah. And, and so I found that school like so helpful that even though I'd been doing this for years, like having that feedback from strangers, like helped my confidence so much more than if I'd just been reading for my friends for the next 20 years. So Take us on a little journey of how you connect with an animal and how you get that information. Because, I mean, I know how I connect with people, but I'm fascinated to know how it works for you. Okay, so um, I, I try to, like, I can do stuff off the cuff, but I try to really meditate and make sure I'm really grounded. And one of my favorite tricks for that is breathing through my feet which sounds nuts, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it gets you focused on your feet and like being your connection with the ground and, and it gets you out of your head because I find I really think a lot when I'm doing this work and it doesn't help to think. Um, that's not where the best messages come from. So I meditate, really ground myself, breathe in through my feet, and then I just kind of open and, you know, introduce myself. Um, I found several pets that have said, oh, thank you for introducing yourself. You'd be amazed at how many people just start talking. <laughs> it's like, okay, so I've learned that one. And then I ask them some questions about what they like, what their favorite treats are, favorite toys. Um, how they get along with other pets or people in the household. 
And that just helps me and their person know that I connected with the right animal. Awesome. <clears throat> so what kind of guidance or healing or, or message do animals often bring through for you? Um, say one of the most common ones, like, like things go in cycles and the, the really common one recently has been like, thank you for hearing me. Mm. Like tell my people, thank you for doing this because I feel heard now. Like, it's not just them telling me what to do. Like, this is a two-way conversation. And, you know, like, I know that like all people want to be seen and heard and it makes perfect sense that animals would feel the same way. If we just don't really think about it very often, you know, like, yeah, that's interesting because so many people see their animals as important members of their family, but not necessarily do they allow the same attributions as they do to human members of the family. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and same, uh, or a similar thing is, um, something that I went through with one of my cats is we call them our fur babies, like for their entire lives, we call them babies. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the biggest changes in, in my cat that I had for 18 years, one of the biggest changes in our relationship was when I was able to go, okay, yeah, you're right. You're not a baby. And like, I, I kind of made it to treating her like a teenager uh, <laughs> you know, during her lifetime. And I, like, I'm trying, I'm trying to shift my thinking on that so that it's more an equal exchange rather than a, I'm going to tell you what to do and get mad if you don't do it. <laughs> That's super interesting. Cause I call like every dog I see, I call baby. Yeah. And I think of my children without fur as babies too. Like even though they're 17 and 19 years old. <laughs> okay. So apparently that's what I need to work on over the next few months. Huh? Thanks for bringing that up, Jennifer. <laughs> well, you know, we all hear our messages when we meet them. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah. I love it. Um, so I have three dogs and each of them has such an interesting personality. Um, one of them has had sessions with a friend of mine who dabbles in animal Reiki and animal communication. Um, how often do you normally see a dog or is it totally dependent on the individual? It's really dependent on their parents, their their human parents and, you know, um, whether they feel like they need to have more conversations on a given topic or not. Um, I have one client that, that calls me about every six months or so and just kind of, would you check in and make sure everything's okay? Um, I have another client that I've lost track of the number of animals that they have. <laughs> And, and she, she calls me mostly when she, when there's something she feels like she can't handle, like one of them sick and she, like, she knows they need to go to the vet, but how can she support them emotionally while they're sick kind of thing. So tell me about the range of animals you do. Cause I mean, obviously we're all familiar with normal domestic pets, but does your work step outside dogs, cats, Ferrets kind of. Yeah. Um, I, I have a client that has tortoises. Um, mm -hmm. and when I was in school, one of my practice partners had a very large tortoise. Like he'd been inherited through the fan, like more than one family they'd passed him down kind oh, of. Wow. I don't even remember how old he was, but he's like two or three feet across. He's huge. Um, yeah, he's really big. Um, in various, I, I, professionally, I have not talked to a wide range of animals, um, walking into a zoo and saying, so I telep telepathically talk with animals. Can I go talk to that elephant? Like, just feels a little weird. Um, maybe I'll get to the point where I'm okay with that, but right now it feels a little <laughs> weird. 
<laughs> but, I think that would be cool as shit. Let's do oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I think it would be awesome. I just don't think that most zoos would be like, yeah, come on in. We can always use another animal communicator. You know? <laughs> but, um, but in various classes that I've taken over the years, um, I've talked to kangaroo, several parrots, a bobcat, a puma, a mountain lion named Cliff, who is like one of my favorites I've ever talked to because mountain lion named Cliff. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing on so many levels. I know. I know. Um, I'm trying, of course, the spiders and the dogs and the cats and... I'm missing something in there, but I, you know, it's a long list at this point. Um, Cl I actually, Cliff is one of the ones I learned a lot from is one of the reasons why he's one of my favorites is he was in the sanctuary and I went into it feeling like, isn't that sad that these beautiful wild animals are, have to live in a sanctuary and like these small cages and everything else. And Cliff was like, Psh this is the best place I have ever been. And they are awesome. They feed me, they pet me, they do things to keep me happy. And I am the king of this place. Like he was just like, this place is great. And it really changed my mind about sanctuaries. I love that. I know he's, he was awesome. <laughs> he was just really great to talk to. That is super cool. And it's, it is a really great perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, we we talk about them or they're often introduced as, like, this animal is an ambassador to help kids learn or help people learn. But but Cliff was really like, I am an ambassador. Like, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. Well, and animals want to, they have a purpose, too. Like, mm -hmm. they don't want to just sit on the couch and chew yak chews all day. That's my dog's new favorite thing, yak chews. We actually raise yaks. So when I saw that recommended as a, a dog chew, I was like, oh, I got to try that. I am not milking a yak, though. Not happening. <laughs> I, I can't say that I blame you on that one. <laughs> so if you ever want to connect with yaks, let me know. I have 11 of them right now. That would be kind of cool for you to, to, wow. to yeah. get to meet them. Yeah, I would love that. So we had our first snowfall couple nights ago of the season and of course one of the mamas calfed like at four o'clock in the afternoon I see this little like turd shaped thing moving around in the pasture so I go down to investigate I'm like seriously you couldn't have done this a couple days ago or waited a couple of days nope but it all turned she out wanted fine. that story for around the kitchen table in 20 years where she could say, I gave birth in a snowstorm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so let's talk about how you have total segue, not such a smooth segue, but, but how you have used non-traditional methods to address depression in your life. I think that's really relevant to so many of yeah. us. Yeah, because a few years ago, I was literally laying in bed watching TV 23 plus hours a day and so tired and unmotivated and depressed that there were days when it was like, I have to get up to pee and I resent that. Like, mm that's depressed. That's yeah. like just as depressed as you can be. And, um, the, the catalyst for me getting help was my cat got sick. Oh. Um, my, my cat who had been literally not never more than a few feet from me for at that point, 12 or 13 years through years of chronic illness, chronic pain and depression. And, she got sick and the vet gave us, what was it? It was liquid tagamet, which as a human, I just went like, ew. I tried to give it to my cat and like, she, it, like it barely went in and she'd spit it back out. It was just disgusting. Um, 
in the human world, Tagamet was one of the most prescribed medications in the 80s. It was for ulcers. I remember my grandmother took it. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I remember in the 80s, it was like it surpassed Valium as the most prescribed drug because at that time it was like all the yuppies were out overworking all the time. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, um, they just kind of said, you know, like here, take the Tagamid and we don't know what happened. And they didn't even say like, come back if it happens again. And it was just like, I was just like, no, I cannot lose my cat. Of all the things in my life, I cannot lose my cat. And I remembered the the woman from the bookstore that I at that point hadn't talked to in more than 10 years. And I looked her up and she was still in the area and still working. And so I called her to talk about my cat. And she said, um, yeah, this is your issue. <laughs> <laughs> like this is your cat has been taking on your stuff for so long that she is now sick. Oh. And I just went like. Oh God. And that was enough for me to go, okay, I'll get help. And right. like, okay, since I'm now affecting someone yep. that I care about outside of me, I'm ready to fix my shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it was like, and had it been a human, I don't know if I would have been ready to fix my, but it was my cat. <laughs> so it was like, okay, let's do this. And and non-traditional methods, I ended up talking to this animal communicator every week for the next three years. And awesome. she gave me amazing advice. And what I learned later was basically cognitive behavioral techniques. And I thought that she was like really smart and like this wise sage. And uh, about a month before she died, she, she repeated something to me at the end of one of our calls. And she said, you know, like, I don't know why I'm supposed to say that. And I said, um, really, you don't know. And she was like, no, I have no idea. And I was like, cause I literally say that to you every week at the end of our phone call. <laughs> so she and she, yeah. And she, she goes, Oh honey, I channel all our, all our things. So right. I don't remember anything. And I was like, Oh, that makes so much more sense now. <laughs> like I've been getting all this like great techniques and like, like super patient, like the same advice over and over and over is like, oh, well, no wonder my guides are so, pa you know, guides have to be patient. <laughs> with us. Right. Feeling and it made so much more sense than, than that it was her being that patient. Um, but that's where I started. And when she passed away, I started working with another coach um, that happened to do gestalt with horses, mm. um, which was really interesting. Uh, we worked together for about a year, and then I met uh, my current coach, who I've been with for a couple of years. But mm. that, but the coaching instead of therapy, where um, I had been in therapy, like when I was a kid, and just repeating the same story over and over just didn't do anything for me. I, I mean, I agree that coaching moves the needle so much more quickly. I did therapy for a little while after I got divorced and I can remember going in there and like, all I wanted to do was cry. I'd cry, like get, there was nothing that happened in the session that should make me want to cry, but I would just cry. Then I started coaching and I still cried, but like it was because it was evocative, not just because I felt sorry for myself. Well, and I found that that like in therapy, their job is to, you know, listen to you um, in coaching. Their job is to get you moving. Yeah. And and. Uh, human beings, like by nature, we want to take action to do to fix things. And so, you know, for me, just repeating the same story was just reinforcing the neurotransmitters attached to the negative story. It wasn't like actually changing my mind about anything. And, and the coach that I work with now teaches a class every week where she teaches us cognitive behavioral theory and techniques. And then we have one-on-ones to like apply it individually. Awesome. And, and and it has been like life changing for me. I, does your cat go to the class with you? Sometimes, 
um, <laughs> sometimes. My previous cat that was the one that got sick, she passed away a couple of years ago. And I think she passed away before I met this coach. Um, but my current cat, sometimes he comes to class. Sometimes he just kind of, you know, takes a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love the perspective. Like whatever serves me is what we're yep. doing. Well, <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, this has been tons of fun. And I'm super excited to share your message and your experience and your process with all of our listeners. Where can they find you? Um, I know we talked about your website at the beginning of, of the conversation and we will include that link, but are there any other places they can look for you? Um, I have uh, contributed chapters to two books and I have a page on Amazon. Awesome. Um, so there, so if you search for my name on Amazon, it does actually come up with the books. It does try to correct the spelling of my name. <laughs> <laughs> But if you put it in, it's there. Um, I also, the best way to to get in touch with me is on Facebook because I'm on it for all my coaching groups. So I'm on there regularly. So um, if you friend me on Facebook, I will absolutely answer messages. Fantastic. So like I said, we'll include all those links so you don't have to try and spell Jennifer's last name. It's been great spending time with you. Thank you for, for sharing with us. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'll see y'all next week on Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. Peace and badass magic. Thank you for listening to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Jamie Hearn. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in. 